Hey guys, welcome back to Talking Sass. I, of course, am Sassy Steffi. Thank you guys so much for joining me for yet another amazing guest. But you know what? Let's take it a step above that because he is legendary within the wrestling business, at least in my opinion. But before we get to that, let's take a little bit of time to talk about something else because Dan Murphy has been on my show twice now giving us wonderful wrestling history lessons. And I think his segment deserves a name, don't you? So here's what we're going to do. If you go to my Instagram and my Twitter, at Sassy Steffi, and you drop me what you think is the best creative and fun name, and if I pick your, I will use it, and also I will send you a prize. I have lots of little goodies I can send you. So make sure you do that. Once again, that's at Sassy Steffi on Instagram and Twitter. Now on to my guest, like I was saying, in my mind, he is legendary. He was with the WWE for over 20 years. He refed 14 WrestleManias, including Edge and Undertaker, which we're definitely going to talk about. He's an author and also a host, and he has the greatest social media ref and rants I absolutely am so entertained by. So I hope you guys will enjoy this episode. He is one of the greatest of all time referees. Here is Jimmy Corderas. Hey guys, welcome back to Talking Sass. I am really excited today because my guest has participated in 14 WrestleManias. He's been in countless TLC matches, but he's not an actual competitor. That's right. I have the one, the only Jimmy Corderas, referee extraordinaire on with me today. And I just want to say, Yasu, Jimmy. Oh, thank you. Yasu. <laughs> Thanks for having me, Steph. It's uh, I. I think we should end the podcast right there. How can I live up to that billing? That's awesome. <laughs> well, I mean, I have so much to talk to you about, so we're definitely not going to end it there because okay. there's so many stories. You had your book that came out that I got plenty of stories and interesting things I want to ask you about. And then, of mm -hmm. course, there's everything since the book that you've also been doing that keeps yourself busy. So I'm really mm -hmm. excited about this. Cool. Yeah. Well, I'll fire away. Whatever you want to know. I'll, I'll, I'll try to get my brain working and remember everything. You know, <laughs> a lot of ref bumps over the day, over the years. Oh, definitely. I'm sure. Yeah. So we'll start then June 6th, 1971. Mm -hmm. That was the very first wrestling show that you went to mm -hmm. and you were nine years old. Tell us a little bit about that. Like how was that as a kid growing up and then going to your first show? It's, it's, it's amazing because, you know, as a, as a young child, you watch it on television and you, you dream about being able to go. And then as you start getting older, sometimes with some people anyways, and it happened with me too, you start dreaming about, hey, maybe one day I can do this. So, but I, first and foremost, as much as I love watching it on TV, I want to go see these guys live because they look larger than life. And then as a nine-year-old going and, and watching it for the first time, you know, and sneaking down as close as you can, you know, you sneak down to ringside <laughs> and you go, man, these guys are big. Wow. And it, it, it's just an incredible feeling. Incredible. Well, just this past year, I took my nephews to their first WWE show. It was a house. Well, it's not their first one, but it was the first one when they had floor seats mm -hmm. and we were right near the guardrail and my youngest who he's, eight or nine so right around the same age you were he like kept running to the guardrail like oh my god look at this guy look at this guy and then Bray Wyatt came out and he was so afraid of him mm -hmm. <laughs> he was it was bad because he was actually having nightmares about him but then afterwards we're friends with a couple of people backstage obviously so he got to meet Bray Wyatt and now he's like I love him as the right. it, it's so great but yeah and when we were seeing some of the guys backstage just the difference in size between my little nephews and them and it's great so when you're nine years old my first independent show I think I was 12 or 13 my first WWE show I was quite a bit older I was probably 18 19 when I went but watched it since I was a kid so definitely that larger than life and I can remember watching it as a kid, even some of the wrestlers that, you know, I was afraid of at the time. Like, I was more afraid of Yokozuna than anybody else. I don't know why, but mm. that was the guy that I was like, uh-uh, no, no. He's a big, he was a big guy. I mean, yeah. like, I could see how he could intimidate uh, young people, you know. And, you know, obviously, as someone who, who, who was privileged enough to get to work with him, I, I saw Rodney in a different light. But at the same time, I could also see how people would get terrified like he, he did that bonsai drop and i kept yeah. thinking to myself you know yes we know it's professional wrestling but at the same time i don't want to be on the receiving end of that sucker <laughs> definitely not definitely not and also papa shango was another one that really really got me as a kid mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. like a I lot can of imagine that. a lot of people 
Yeah, a lot of people say Taker, but for me, it was, no, it was Papa Shango. And I had a chance to meet him at a convention. And later on that night, there was a show and he asked me to be one of his hoes. And I, for obviously, he's the godfather as well. Yeah. And uh, I was like, no, I had my moment. I, you, <laughs> I met Papa Shango. I got my picture with him. I can't. Like, the, nothing gets better than that for me. <laughs> That's awesome. Yeah, and it's funny because you mentioned Taker. And, and Taker, yeah, and it's, he's scary, but at the same time, there's this aura about him, mm -hmm. you know, just the way he presents himself, the way he comes out, the way he walks, the way he's present, uh, you know, that look, it's kind of scary, but at the same time, you're more in awe, I think. Definitely. Yeah. And I mean, he has that, when the gong hits and all that, you know, like that's the, under there's no mistaking it's the undertaker. Anytime you hear that music or you see him, anything, you just, right. it's all completely him. There's been mm -hmm. tons of ripoffs, but it's always genuinely him. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> so now before you actually started getting, ref before you started refereeing, you were doing a host of jobs for w well, WWF at the time in Canada, because mm -hmm. you mm -hmm. were working for the Canadian office. And that includes chauffeuring certain wrestlers around. And some of these names are just, to me, classic and to everybody classic i mean you have piper you have andre you have hogan you have macho man you have even vince senior i mean yes for somebody who was just breaking into the business and meeting these type of people like when i first started meeting people from wwe tv when i was i don't know 20 or so like i was just awestruck like in front of them how was that for you driving them around and probably getting to hear a lot of behind the scenes stories when you weren't exactly wise to the business yet right no it it was it was incredible it, 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 this, i'm all this stuff is going through your head like you know jack tunney hands you the keys to his fleetwood cadillac and says hey go to the marriott by the airport and go pick up andre and uh and timmy white is traveling with him so you know he's you know so make sure you bring up timmy and i'm like you you're trying not to go holy crap, it's Andre. You know what I mean? But it's, you're trying to be professional, but at the same time inside you're jumping up and down and going, this, this is going to be great. So, you know, and then Hogan, and like you said, and Piper who used to call me Gabe because back in the day when I had hair, it was all curly. Mm -hmm. And he said, I look like Gabe Kaplan. So my name, my name to him was Gabe because he, I guess he meets so many people. It's hard to remember. Oh, for sure. So he just looked at me and just said, Hey Gabe, what's up? You know, that kind of stuff. But like you said, it, it was awe-inspiring. And again, the hardest part was trying to act professional without acting like a giddy little kid. You know what I mean? <laughs> Definitely. Because I mean, I had the first time I worked with a major, a major name on a show was Mick Foley. And like, I remember I walked into the locker room, I saw him and I turned around and walked out. I was like, I'm, how am I in the same locker room with this, this mm. giant star in my head? You know, I mean, he is a giant star, but I mean, to me, he was just everything in wrestling, you know, mankind, dude, love, Cactus Jack. I mean, he had all these characters. Just I didn't deserve to be in the same locker room as him is what I thought, you know, and obviously he's the sweetest human being in the world. But mm -hmm. I love yeah. Mick. If there's one, if there's one good guy you want to meet uh, first time, uh, Mick is on that list. Definitely. I've never heard a person say one bad word about Mick. He's so yeah. sweet and genuinely just a nice guy. Like I have, I have mm -hmm. a couple Mick Foley stories that like just make me like chuckle in my head every time I think of them. That particular show, one of the guys, as I talked about ripoffs earlier, but uh, he was a uh, Stone Cold Steve Austin guy. But what he did instead of beer in the corner, he did Jack Daniels. Mm -hmm. So I was managing him. And he would go up in the corners. Of course, his Jack Daniels bottle is gimmicked. It is iced tea. <laughs> and mine that I'm giving out, they had 20, it was in the States. So 21 and over had wristbands. So I would go out and I'd give shots to the fans who had wristbands. And mm -hmm. we would all take a shot with him when he's up in the corner. And I was obliterated, but it was fun. But that particular show, Mick comes over to me and he's like, um, what's in there? And I was like, oh, well, his is, is iced tea but this is jack daniels we you know toast shots to the crowd and he's mm -hmm. like we're gonna do a shot before we go out there and i was like what oh. <laughs> and he was so much fun he just like after that moment like i was totally chill with him you know i didn't feel like he was this big superstar that i should be like in complete awe of he's just so down to earth mm -hmm. and normal like everybody else yeah exactly don't believe the hype and if i can i, I understand exactly where you're coming from because having 
been around a legend, an icon like Andre the Giant, away from the ring. Um, he's one of those people that if he offered you a drink, for example, you cannot say no. <laughs> There's so some stories exactly, in your book. <laughs> yes. Yeah, so, so I know exactly what you're talking about. <laughs> <laughs> Definitely. And while we're talking about your book, I noticed you have a copy of your book there behind you, The Three Count. Book yes. is so amazing. Thank you. You're Thank welcome. You. Uh, again, uh, all the credit goes to my wife for uh, you know, convincing me to do it. Because, you know, sometimes I'm thinking to myself, uh, do I have enough stories? Is there enough story there to tell? And she kept telling me, of course you do. You were there for over 20 years. You've got to, I said, now it's time to remember everything and try to put it down <laughs> on paper and present it in a way that maybe people will find interesting. And uh, I, I, I'm glad people did. And, and it's humbling to know that people enjoyed it. Yeah, definitely. Like I said, I've read it before, but then I read it again just to make sure like I you know, didn't get anything wrong. And plus I wanted to write down certain, certain stories I wanted to talk about with you. And mm -hmm. I just, every time like I could feel like your good nature within it as it's, you know, as I'm reading it, like I've only met you, I think twice in person, mm -hmm. but like I could read it in your voice, like hearing, you know, your ref and rants and stuff like some of the stories I could hear, like, okay, this was Jimmy Corderas's exact words. <laughs> <laughs> well, thank you. That, that, that means a lot. Really, it does. Well, th I, thank you for writing it and sharing those stories with us because mm -hmm. they're amazing. I mean, I obviously never got the chance to meet people like Andre and Piper and stuff like that. So to live vicariously through you in the book, it's, it's a lot of fun. Well, thank you. I, again, it's a, I, I've been blessed, you know, like people say, wow, well, you know, uh, it's, it's a tough life being on the road that, that many days a year and stuff like that. And yes, it is. But at the same time, like you said, I'm with Andre, I'm with Hogan, I'm with, I'm with, the, I'm with these icons and legends. And I'm like, this is kind of cool. <laughs> yeah, definitely. Something you can't take advantage. Like in those moments, you don't really realize you're making so many memories, but then you look back mm -hmm. and you're like, wow, I got to experience this moment that millions of other people will never get to experience with this person. Absolutely. Fun. Absolutely. So now we'll go back to the beginning of your career, talk a little bit more about getting into refereeing. So Pat Patterson, a famous Montreal guy from where I'm at, he mm -hmm. suggested you to become a ref at first, but uh, Jack, you, as you mentioned earlier, was a little bit hesitant on that. Yeah, it was weird. Like, like you said, I've been driving guys around and I've been doing a lot of stuff in the back. So I was in the back, I was in the locker room, I was, you know, mingling with the, the, the talent and stuff like that. And they used to do TV in Brantford every three weeks and we'd be there and, you know, uh, Billy Red Lions for the Canadian television and then Mean Gene for the other international stuff. They'd be doing interviews and I'd be watching them do the uh, promos, you know, for TV and stuff. So Pat just went to Jack one day because I, and I was right there. He says, Hey, you know, we got the kid here. He does his stuff and all day he just sits around and waits for us to finish so he can keep doing more stuff. He says, why don't we use him? We'll make him a referee. And I remember this is Jack's exact words to Pat. Well, we don't want to smarten the kid up yet. Do we? And Pat's <laughs> like, but he's in the back with all the boys in the locker room and he, he kind of knows what's going on. We just teach him to ref. And Jack says, well, we'll see. So Pat came up to me and just said, go get yourself some black, black sneakers, black pants. Uh, at the time, a baby blue uh, yep. dress shirt and a black bow tie and carry it with you all the time. But I didn't know enough to go up and start asking questions and, and say to guys like Dave Hebner and Timmy White and say, hey, uh, can you kind of fill me in on the referee thing? Yeah. So I didn't know enough to ask them, you know, to teach me. Well, you're still naive at that time, especially, I mean, you're still in awe of these guys. I mean, I remember the beginning of my career, which obviously vastly different time frames there, but you know, you're, you don't know any better. You're just like, oh, I'm just enjoying being here. And you know, when, cause I got into wrestling accidentally, I won't go into that whole story, but like I was ring announcing and somebody asked me like, why don't you wrestle? You obviously have a passion for it. And I was like, holy crap, why don't I? Like, I never thought of it prior to that you know like it wasn't something I was interested well not that I wasn't interested I loved it but you know I didn't know if I could actually hang you know and do it mm -hmm. so in February 1987 you actually ref your first match yeah and then from yeah. there I mean we go 20 well it was 22 years you were with WWF WWE correct um, let me see. So uh, I actually started working for Jack and doing stuff for the Canadian office in, in late 85, okay. roughly. Um, 
and then you know did that year basically and then uh in february of 87 uh we were at a a spot show here in newmarket ontario and chief jay strongbow just walks up to me who is the, the the lead agent for the ma uh, for the night and says hey jimmy you got your rest stuff with you and i said yes i do chief he says put it on you're reffing tonight what am I supposed to say? No, I mean, like, I, I'm not, you know, the first thing I want to say is, but I, nobody's kind of taught me anything yet. And mm -hmm. So I said, okay, he says, you're going to do one match with uh, SD Jones versus Jose Luis Rivera, who was the red demon under a mask, right? Okay. And I said, okay, cool. So I went to SD, thank goodness, because SD was a good friend. And I said, SD, I'm refing your match. And he says, oh, great. I said, I've never refereed a match before says, listen to me, stay close. I will get you through it. Don't worry. Mm -hmm. He talked me through the whole match. I must have been like uh, very robotic, I'm, I'm assuming, but at the same time, he got me through it. Yeah. And Chief just said, uh, you did okay. All you you got to learn to relax. Well, of course. I mean, trial by fire here. You're going to be nervous. Yeah. yeah so, the, but that was my first experience. But I think uh, a lot, like I said, if it wasn't for SD, it might've been a different story. Who knows? He, he kept... Even though I was nervous, he kept me somewhat calm, if that makes any kind of sense. Well, yeah, there's definitely people that can see you're nervous and talk you through something. And especially in the moment, maybe with refing, I don't know for you, I'm not speaking for you. Maybe this is a situation though. You're so in the moment, you don't really realize that you've got those nerves as bad as you actually have them at that moment. Mm -hmm. yeah, no, that's true. Cause you, you kind of forget to be nervous. Yes, exactly. Yeah, because I know still with wrestling, like when I would go to the ring, I'd have like those jitters right before I went out. But then like as soon as I came out from the curtain and heard the crowd or whatever, I was like, OK, now I just I go into kind of autopilot. I know what I have to do. And it's like the feelings mm -hmm. that you have just kind of <laughs> subside. They stay on the other side of the curtain there. No, I hear you. I, I, I totally understand. Trust me. <laughs> so 14 WrestleManias and WrestleMania mm -hmm. six is one of them that I want to talk about. Okay. Because I, when I read your book, it made me laugh and made me think of a story and it kind of comes semi full circle for you. So Edge was in the crowd as a kid watching mm -hmm. and you t in your book, you said Edge used to uh, kind of joke around with you a little bit saying that, Hey, I used to watch you ref as a kid. And mm -hmm. when I met Edge, I was like, Oh my God, I've loved you so much since I was a kid. And he was like, Oh, thanks. Making me feel old now. <laughs> yep. So yep. It doesn't come full circle exactly, but he definitely knows what it feels like now because I did that to him about 10 years ago. <laughs> <laughs> I can imagine too. I can imagine how it was at the rumble too this year when he showed up and, and, and I could, some of the younger guys in the locker room, Oh, you were my hero growing up. I mean, I, yeah. 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 <laughs> <laughs> Cause he was, he's really not that old. I nope. mean, at all, but he got started in the business so young, especially in mm -hmm. Canada. I mean, not even before WWE days. So, I mean, right. he's, he's not that old. So for somebody that's like 10 years younger than him to be like, Hey, I watched you as a kid. And he's like, mm -hmm. Oh my God, say that. Yeah, no, I did. Uh, he said that to me and, and I wasn't, it's, it's hard to explain. I wasn't offended or anything by it. It's kind of like, uh, at first you go, Oh, that's cool. He kind of watched me. And then you start going, wait a minute. You watched me when you were a kid, boy, you know, <laughs> then, then it starts to click in, you know what I mean? It's like, how old am I again? <laughs> yeah, definitely. How long have I been doing this for? Yes. Yeah, but it, it's kind of cool, though, because, uh, you know, I, and I've seen a picture of him in the crowd at WrestleMania 6. Yeah. You know, and I'm like, man, you know, it, it's kind of cool that, that, you know, someone who was a fan, and then you get to work with him and watch him become as good as edge became you know what i mean it's kind of oh cool. yeah well and to bring the wrestlemania and edge full circle i mean in wrestlemania 24 mm -hmm. you refed edge versus undertaker and they both requested you to actually wrestle or to ref their match and that was yes. your last wrestlemania that you did mm -hmm. right yes uh, that was my final wrestlemania didn't know at the time it was going to be but it was right. but uh yeah i was scheduled to do a different match and uh um, I even know that I still remember the town, Little Rock, Arkansas. We went there for TV to do SmackDown and, uh, and Edge, uh, I walk into the locker room and Edge goes, Hey, Jimmy, you got a minute? I said, yeah, absolutely. What's up? He says, yeah, come with me. And so I, I followed him and he, he took me to take her and he said, Hey, we, you know, we're, we're requesting you to do our match at WrestleMania. So again, 
two schools of thought. This is so awesome. But then, you know, it's like, okay, now I'm, I, I don't want to let these guys down. You know what I mean? Now you're starting to think, oh boy, uh, you know, I can't mess because let's be honest, you can mess up. And I, I was confident in my work. Don't get me wrong. But at the same time, this is the main event of WrestleMania. So, you know, I'm mean? like, okay, I'm, I'm nervous, but wow, this is what a moment. And, uh, and, and that was it, what came out of my mouth. I said, I, I so much thank you guys. I appreciate you guys having the confidence in me. I won't let you down. And Taker just looked at me and said, we know you won't. And that like, was like, oh my goodness, you know? Yeah, I mean, talk about the ultimate compliment, especially yeah. coming from two people who, even at that time, there's and maybe not Edge so much then because that was like obviously pre-injury, but like to become these two huge legends, obviously Taker already, but like to have them say like, we're asking for you because we have confidence in what you can do in the ring. And then you're also, I don't know if it was discussed then or later, you take the big boot from Taker during that. Yes. How was that? I mean, I can only imagine oh. his boot has got to be bigger than the size of, of our heads. Oh my goodness. I, I, I want to say, I want to say 14, if I'm not mistaken, somewhere around there between, but anyway, it, it, when, when we were, of, of course, giving, pulling back the curtain a little bit here, you yeah. know, going over the match and stuff like that, it was basically, you know, they wanted a spot to take me out of the match. And it had to be something devastating enough to take me out to have another referee who ended up being Charles run down. So, you know, Taker looks at me and goes, are you okay with taking a big boot? I said, absolutely. And inside, you know, it wasn't like, oh boy, I'm taking a big boot. It was like, oh, this is so cool. It's WrestleMania and I'm taking <laughs> a big boot from The Undertaker. It doesn't get better than this. Yeah, definitely. I mean, he's, miss I'm, I mean, Shawn Michaels is Mr. WrestleMania, but the other person that you automatically think when you think WrestleMania is Undertaker because of his yeah. streak and everything that he's done, how many, I don't even know off the top of my head, how many WrestleManias, you know, he was a part yeah. of, I mean, obviously we know his, his streak, but it's just crazy. Like mm -hmm. I, if anybody like of that stature asked me to take a move from them, I mean, that's just ultimate. Yes. All day long. Yeah. Yeah. That's Absolutely. so cool. Yeah. Now, are there any other matches that you've had when you were refereeing in WWE that were like that memorable to you, or maybe even more so because oh. of personal reasons? Uh, they, I can I can name, you know, the ones that really pop out to me right now. Um, what year SummerSlam was it? That the match that opened up SummerSlam was Rey Mysterio versus Kurt Angle, mm -hmm. who um, uh, just a phenomenal match and stuff like that. But there's, there's one match that, that flies under a lot of radars, but for me, it was one of my favorite matches that I ever refereed. It was again, Kurt Angle versus Eddie Guerrero. It was a SmackDown match that I want to say went through three segments. It was like a three segment match on SmackDown. Is that like and that's that? a long time. Yeah. That, those all stand out to me. And of course, you know, the, the TLC matches, which were like very creative and innovative and, just making sure everybody's okay because uh, there are some some certain crazy bumps in there. But uh, uh, wow, doing Kurt Angle, uh, Kurt Henning, Mr. Perfect versus Hulk Hogan at Maple Leaf Gardens. I mean, like, where, where do I begin? This is just I've been like I said, I've been blessed. I mean, no complaints on this end. Trust me. Absolutely. I mean, just the names of those matches that you say. Like, I don't know exactly what happened in all of those matches. But the names, I'm just like, oh, man, I can only imagine being in the ring and seeing the magic that those two put people, mm -hmm. or if you're in tag matches, put together. Like you said, the TLC matches, which you were a part of, like, a lot of those because mm -hmm. you were in the original one. Right. And then they continued as your as your career there. They always asked you because you were kind of the referee that knew what to do in that aspect because you were the person who was always there. Uh, in a sense, I, I don't, it's kind of funny because I, I, I felt it was my responsibility to look out and keep an eye on things going on around because, you know, stuff can get put in a place where it could be in a dangerous spot for the guys who want to do their spots. Mm -hmm. uh, I think uh, WrestleMania in Houston, remember when, when Edge did the spear on Jeff Hardy was hanging from the belts? Yeah, it's one of the most iconic moments ever. Yeah. But if you look down in the bottom right-hand corner of your screen, you can see me pulling a ladder out so that they don't land on it. 
Oh yeah, that could have been bad news. Yeah, see, see, and, and not to put myself over, but that's what I did. I ran around to make sure that in in a match where so much can can there's so many ways that it can go south. Mm -hmm. Make sure that at least try to make it as safe as possible for the guys, if that makes any kind of sense in a match like TLC. Well, yeah, I mean, they're definitely putting their bodies out there on the line for the entertainment of the fans. But like you said, there's so much going on. You need to kind of be wary of what's going on. Like I've done some hardcore matches and I can tell you they're not my favorite kind because you never know if a table goes here or a ladder goes there, what's, you know, what's going to be broken into pieces or splintered and all that kind of stuff. So it's very dangerous. And I don't know if maybe people realize that, you know, that are just fans that it's not just the moves. It's also these things breaking and the things going on around that can also add injuries. No, absolutely. It's, 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 it, you know, it, you look at a simple thing like, uh, you know, running the ropes or something like that. You tweak it, you, you twist a knee and ankle, even something simple like that, you, you just never know. Right. I mean, obviously, but, but the, every, every time you increase the risk level with a move, you increase the risk level with an injury as well. Definitely. I mean, you see a lot of the high flyers on WWE, not even high flyers exactly all the time, but they always have the rock tape on to, mm -hmm. you know, kind of help aid in some, some painful injuries or nagging injuries that they might still have. I mean, what, I, I mean, I wrestled maybe once a weekend, twice a weekend, maybe three times a week if I was lucky. But I mean, some of the WWE superstars, they're wrestling four, five, six, seven times a week. I mean, and no mm -hmm. real time off. And there'd be, you know, oh, I'm like next weekend, I'm just not going to, you know, book any shows. That's mm -hmm. not how it works in WWE. You're a WWE superstar, especially if you're mm -hmm. on the high caliber end where yeah. people want to see you and you're, merch, you're a merch seller. You're working all the time. Yeah, obviously a little different now during these oh, yes. current situations, but uh, under, for lack of a better term, normal circumstances, it, it's a tough grind. It, it really is. Yeah, I know a lot of people say this isn't ballet, which is hard because I know some dancers who are like, ballet is not easy either. Yeah. <laughs> it, it's really tough on the body and, and mm -hmm. even tough on the mind. I mean, a lot of this year, I think with a lot of people being more inside and having to deal with their own emotions it's been a lot harder mm -hmm. for everybody too and with wrestling you know you're not go 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 you're sitting and okay you do a show once in a week or twice a week and mm -hmm. you're really not you have to really sit and think about everything else you've been doing in your life yeah it's funny you said that because like you said you you work once twice maybe three times a week so for you to jump, let's say, to WWE and go through that full-time schedule, it's an adjustment period that you're going to have to go through. Now for the WWE superstars who have been doing that schedule and now doing maybe two days of television a week, mm -hmm. as opposed to like five or six days or whatever it was, that's an adjustment for them too, because your body gets accustomed to, let's say, bumping five days a week as opposed yeah. to two days a week. So, you know, it's, it's a... Eh. I'm well, I going off on a tangent here. <laughs> that, no, I understand because I explain to people sometimes they're like, "Doesn't it hurt when you fall?" I'm like, "Yeah, it hurts, but you kind of like it's kind of like a mechanic when they have callus on their hands. Like yeah. that's your body just it doesn't physically most likely have callus on them, but your body just kind of absorbs it, and that's something normal that it is used to. So your body is just yeah. adjusts, I guess, is the best way. Yep. Yeah, yeah. So. What are you going to do? So after WWE, you went on, you wanted to start broadcasting, which you have been doing quite a bit of, and we're going to talk about, because I find like we have kind of a little bit of similarities. In 2012, I went to broadcasting school. Obviously, I said I started as a ring announcer, and then I started wrestling. But then like I went back, and I'm like, okay, I need to have something to do once wrestling does kind of go on the wayside. So I started broadcasting school. And then I moved to Canada and I was totally out of my element. That's just for one. But anyway, so you, you have to learn how to say a, a lot. <laughs> <laughs> well, here in, in uh, Quebec, you also have to be uh, pretty fluent. Yeah. With French, which mm. is not, I can say six years living here is not something I am very good at. I'm not. And my wife is from Quebec and she is. Yeah. Bilingual, so it, it, boy, I, I'm, I am not in the least. I, I, 
she likes to joke that I am bilingual. I, I speak English and Gringlish. <laughs> you, know, the, yeah. you know, it's funny that you say that because I am starting to learn a few Greek words here and there because my son mm -hmm. goes to a Greek daycare. And obviously, okay. Chris, my husband, knows Greek. Mm -hmm. And so I'm learning like words here and there. So I, I'm not probably at your level, but I probably speak a little bit of Greeklish too. So there you go. Yeah, no, it's it's fun actually sometimes. Yeah, definitely. So you started. You actually started working with Arda Okal when you first mm -hmm. started doing in the broadcasting, and he started you coming in with a segment he called "Ask the Ref," which was just a cute little. 30, 45 second uh, segment where you ask the ref a question and that was it. But then it grew into something so much more because now you're one of the co-hosts on Aftermath, which is a show that's here in uh, Canada for the US people who don't realize or even other countries. Mm -hmm. And you actually, you've gotten to work. It, when I was doing my, my notes, I was like, wow, a lot of the people he works with either works for WWE or went mm -hmm. on to work for WWE in the in the uh, future because obviously Arter O'Cal at one time worked with WWE mm -hmm. uh you worked with Renee Paquette which everybody knows is Renee Young mm -hmm. you worked with uh Mauro Ronaldo who also mm -hmm. went on and I think he's still doing commentary for NXT maybe and then you've even I wrote so many things down but yeah so I mean a lot of the people that you've come to oh and Aftermath of course Santino or Anthony's yes. on there so, yep. I mean, a lot of the people, you're still pretty into the WWE families. I mean, of course, that's never going to go away. You were there for 20 plus years. Mm -hmm. But I mean, you're still pretty involved. Yeah, um, obviously, you know, uh, I w like you said, uh, you, you, I still have that connection with WWE with mm -hmm. regards to people that I still have friends there uh, and stuff like that. Um, I don't work for them technically, according to some people who think I, I, I do, I don't. I work for Sportsnet, which is the company that airs WWE programming here in Canada. But mm -hmm. back to the start of it, yes, you're right. Uh, Ardo Cal and I met at a, uh, a local indie show here in Toronto, and we got to talking and we just hit it off right off the bat. Like we just be became friends and it was like, and uh, so he says, yeah, I, I, I want to do this wrestling show at the score at the time. Mm -hmm. uh, Toronto and um, he says do you mind can you do a segment like we could do it over the phone where you know it's called ask the ref and uh, we'll do a quick question and that'll be a segment I said yeah absolutely let's have some fun with it and then um, like you I went to I went to a broadcasting school to you know kind mm -hmm. of figure it out because everybody assumes oh you just get on the mic and you start talking no there's a lot more to it than <laughs> definitely but, so he said listen um he, he, he was doing a show with Moro at the time and uh, I'm not going to get into what happened, but anyways, he contacted me and says, look, Moro's not going to be doing a show anymore. Would you come in with me on Monday nights? And after Raw, we would do a show called Right After Wrestling. So we were live on the score uh, radio with Right After Wrestling, which morphed into Aftermath and then became a television program. That had uh, that started off again with with uh, Arda, Moro, and um, and Renee, and then when Moro uh, parted ways and went to the MMA world and did his other stuff, I became the third the third person on the show, with Renee and Arda, and again blessed again. I'm still there doing <laughs> it now with with uh, with Santino or AC as I like to call him and yeah. uh, Nug Nargang and of course Caroline who's who's off for a little while. So uh, we got Kevin uh, Mickey filling in for, for now and uh, still having fun. You know, we do our wins and fails for the week, what we liked, what we didn't like, but even in the fail, we don't try to, t we try to be positive because yeah. it's kind of like, there's so much negativity going on with wrestling nowadays and people saying, Oh, this is no good. And this wasn't good. And this, you know what, it may not have appealed to you, but, you know, let's try to find some positives too, because not everything is bad. Right. And I mean, everybody has an opinion, so nobody's necessarily right or wrong. It's just what they liked or disliked. Mm -hmm. And people tend to take things a little too personally, perhaps some people. Yeah. Me, you well, know, you, you take it with a grain of salt, in my opinion, mm -hmm. but you know, some people aren't able to do that. Yeah, no, I, I get it. Yeah. Uh, and with the ask the ref, did that mm -hmm. inspire you to do your ref and rant that you do on your social media accounts? 
Um, I don't know if that was a pre pre precipice for it, but at the same time, again, I have to um, give credit where credit is due. And like I said, when, when you talk about marriage, mm -hmm. um, my wife doesn't like it when I say this, but I outkicked my coverage. And she's been a big inspiration for a lot of what I do now. And, you know, she's in tune with the social media stuff as well. And she says, you know, there's a lot of people out there doing stuff. Why don't you do something for social media? So then we kind of brainstormed a little bit. And we came up with an idea uh, of doing a quick one minute video daily. That just a little thing that, uh, who was it that used to say, you know, what grinds my gears? Oh, uh, Peter Griffin from. Uh yes. Peter, yeah, it was a Peter Griffin thing, uh, grind, what grinds my gears, and it was kind of like, well, what? Do we, and I thought, you know, we can do an easy hashtag, ref and rant, mm -hmm. you know, and that's where it morphed from. We, we yeah, again, I, I give credit to where credit is due, you know, like it, it was, it was an idea that she had thought of that we worked together on, and then just came up with, and she films every one of them for me too. So, <laughs> you know, she, she's my camera person. <laughs> That's awesome. Like uh, my husband, obviously, Chris, you know him. He uh, mm -hmm. is a lot of the inspiration behind a lot of the things that I do. And obviously my computer right now is my computer is my, uh, my, com my camera person, I guess, if I can talk correctly. <laughs> but uh, he does a lot of the editing and he's really the person who pushed me towards doing my podcast and doing these things. And it's just awesome that like you have such a great supporting role behind you like i mean they say behind every great man is a great woman so obviously audra the, 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 no the, <laughs> that is true that is true because and i got to give her credit because we talked about that schedule too in wwe like, mm -hmm. let's face it being being a smackdown referee and also working on the ring crew i would leave um to go on the road friday mornings usually mm -hmm. and uh, she would drop me off at the airport and then she would come pick me up on wednesdays uh, and then, you know, uh, that's when she wasn't working. If when she was working, sometimes dad would do it. You know what I mean? It yeah. Kind of cool. And dad used to like to do it cause he was retired at the time. He said, well, let me go get him. You know what I mean? But imagine that, you know, you're home almost two days, Yeah. a week. And that wasn't easy for her. I, I, oh, I definitely. It, you know? so, so, you know, for her to stick around for, through that and then, and to continue to inspire me, uh, like I said, I would kick my coverage big time. <laughs> <laughs> well, we definitely, Ref and Rant is a thing that brings Chris and I pleasure almost every morning we watch it <laughs> together because we're just like, oh, what did Jimmy have to say about, you know, this time? And I mean, you don't just cover WWE, you cover AEW, you cover, you know, whatever's going on. And, mm -hmm. you know, it's not always even Ref and Rants. You have done your Ref and Respects to mm -hmm. like most recently Tracy Smothers, of course, who yes. just recently passed, who is... If you don't know who Tracy Smothers is, please go find him on YouTube. Such mm -hmm. a great storyteller, such a great promo guy. Just mm -hmm. awesome to be around. Always, I mean, I was, that one hurt the wrestling yeah. business as a whole because he was such a great guy to be around. No, he was, he was awesome. And the, the one thing, and again, when you talk about, you talked about Mick Foley earlier. You haven't met mm -hmm. one person who had a, a, a negative word to say about Mick. Same thing about Tracy. Tracy was so awesome. And I didn't get to know him as well as I got to know Mick, but he was one of those guys that was always willing to offer advice, to help. You know, he was there. It, he wasn't just there to collect, you know, and some, he wasn't there to collect a check. He was there yeah. to, because he loved it. He truly loved it. It was in his blood and he was giving back all the time. And, and yeah, that, that one did hit hard. Yeah, he, when I met him, he was working a lot for Cleveland All Pro Wrestling for JT Lightning. And the two of them together was, was quite, uh, quite an interesting show when those two were on the same show together. I could only imagine. <laughs> so let's get back to you because another thing that you also do sometimes on your social media, you have um, Ref to Chef. Yes. And Chris just wants me to remind you, thank you for the frappe recipe that you gave me last year because <laughs> he loves his frappes. And I know yes. you said that was your wife's actual recipe. <laughs> no, I take, but that's it. It's mostly her recipes and I just take them and I, I, I make them and, and I'm, I'm having fun doing it again. It, you know, uh, all those years growing up in a Greek family, mom did all the cooking. Mm-hmm. You know what I mean? Dad didn't do any cooking. I don't remember dad cooking anything. <laughs> but, uh, you know, and I just, my, my wife is a ter terrific cook, but I, I don't know. I, 
I have in my later years found enjoyment in actually get, at making dinner and stuff like that. Not every night. Yeah. But, but I like doing it, you know, and, uh, um, I like watching the food network uh, sometimes too. And stuff <laughs> like that. So I'm having fun with it. And, and who knows, you talk about broadcasting, maybe that's another, uh, another segment that could come up on the show. You never know. Definitely. I mean, I, I, I love cooking dinner too. And I've, you said you came from a Greek family. For those who don't know, I married into a big Greek family. And so like, I've, tried to learn pasticcio and the cookies at Easter, which I've got those down pretty well. But the pasticcio is still one that just surpasses my knowledge of how to make everything go perfectly. And I'm also impatient. So when it takes five hours to make a dinner, <laughs> I'm just mm -hmm. not for it. So it's only special occasions that pasticcio gets made. And I always make sure my mother-in-law's here for it. There you go. Yeah, because you know who the biggest critic is going to be is your mother-in-law. Yeah, but she, I, I'm very lucky because I know a lot of people complain about their in-laws, but my in-laws are honestly the best people. Nice. Um, my mom passed right around the same time I met Chris. So when that happened, they really kind of just wrapped their arms around me. Even though I wasn't married to him at the time, I was just dating him and wrapped their arms around me and really brought me in as a family member, even though I'm not 0% Greek and everybody else in the family is 100% Greek. Uh, yeah, well, you and my wife were in the same boat, and you were both blessed to be accepted by the family. Yeah, and yeah. and uh, you know, there's a lot of misconception, you know, because of my big fat Greek wedding that uh, yeah. outsiders don't get accepted very well. I, I'm sure it happens, but uh, you know, uh, um, again, sounds like sounds like your in-laws are awesome, and, and my parents accepted my wife, which is, you know, yeah. Being being a part of a Greek family is awesome as well because there's so many different traditions and everything that mm -hmm. I didn't partake in when I was a kid, but now I'm teaching them to my son, which is just amazing because, I mean, I was a typical American, you know, it was like, okay, right. Christmas, Easter, whatever, these are the holidays. There wasn't really like a lot of so-called traditions, but here, you know, different holidays have different meanings mm -hmm. and things. It's I love it. No, I could go on all day about being... I know being married into a Greek family and how wonderful it is, especially the food. <laughs> yeah. And, I, and I'm learning about Polish traditions too, because my wife is a uh, father is from Poland. So. Oh, does he make pierogies? No, my wife does. My wife oh. Makes pierogies, yeah. oh, pierogies. That's like my weakness. <laughs> There's a uh, big one day when this thing is over with and you guys are in Toronto. Definitely. We'll invite you over for pierogies. Definitely. We'll have pierogies to make and pasticcio. <laughs> yeah, that's a weird <laughs> talk oh, about P &P. carb overload. <laughs> there you go, P and P. <laughs> I would love that, and I I've never been to the Hockey Hall of Fame, and that's right there. So I'm sure we could make a whole weekend of that. Oh, there you go. Yeah, yeah. definitely. Well, let's talk more about wrestling because there's still okay. a few more questions that I have for you that weren't okay. exactly covered in your book. So, what wrestlers today, if you were to wrestle, would be your dream match? Ooh. It's tough because, um, like, there's two schools of thought here. Everybody talks about, you know, the uh, evolving the business and, 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 and stuff like that. And, and guys are trying to elevate uh, what they do in the ring. For me, I'm, I'm still, and I know people are going to say, oh, you old fart or whatever. But I'm a storytelling guy. I like guys mm -hmm. who go out there. And, and uh, I got to tell you, if I, was, if I was able to work a match with Randy Orton, Right now, that would be my guy. And someone who right now who's really getting into his own uh, and I think has found his niche is Roman Reigns. Oh, I'm loving it. I was, yeah. I was not a huge Roman Reigns fan, but right now what he's doing is oh. off the charts. Yeah, and, and it just goes to show you that um, as your career progresses, it, you know, obviously as a young person in the business, you can get over Mm -hmm. But it doesn't mean you know everything. Getting over doesn't mean you know what you're doing. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> it means very true. resonating. Now I think, I think um, things are falling into place. Randy just gets it, and uh, and has. Roman is getting it. Mm -hmm. So that would be right it. No, yeah. that would be a good matchup too, because I know obviously they've wrestled in the past before, but like both of them with the characters where they're at. I know WWE usually typically sticks to babyface heel thing but to see both yeah. of them right now as they are in their own different elements would be awesome to see but if you're going to go babyface heel 
Um, I'm looking right now, and of course, there's, I think there's rumors flying that maybe Daniel Bryan is looking to wind down his full-time in-ring career. Mm -hmm. And if that are the case, why not him versus a, a Roman Reigns? Because yes. the storytelling in that match, or even have him against Randy Orton, even though he's a SmackDown superstar, I get it. But at yeah. the same time, you have two great heel storytellers against someone like Daniel Bryan, who is a great worker who could tell stories in the ring as well. I think for me, that's awesome. Yeah. And I know, of course, this is going to air in like two weeks, but right now the match, I think you did your ref and rant about today was Eddie mm -hmm. Kingston and John Moxley. That yes. storytelling is amazing. Yeah. If I, if I can for a minute, go on a little bit of a tangent here sure. on your show. Um, I, I keep seeing people talk about, oh, look at the moves these guys are doing. Look how, you know, and all this and how cool this looks and how cool that looks. I don't disagree with you. Yes, they do look cool. The moves look spectacular. But in the grand scheme of things, they don't mean anything because it doesn't lead to anything other than that was a cool move. When you talk about the last couple of weeks, especially in AEW, what have people been talking about the most? The story. They've been talking about the Eddie Kingston, John Moxley promo se segment. Mm -hmm. from dynamite and the chris jericho and mjf yeah. uh segment where they were dancing uh, my best friend and all that stuff i love that see see again uh, two schools of thought for me again was i entertained absolutely i thought it was well done it was fun it was entertaining it made me smile it put a smile on my face but from a business standpoint where my head mm -hmm. goes I'm looking at it like, okay, MJF is the guy they're trying to build as this monster heel. Yeah. They want him to be a bad guy. They want people to dislike him and in and, and, and in the world of suspending disbelief in pro wrestling, you want to see him get his butt kicked by the baby face. Even though Chris Jericho is not technically a baby face, but still. Yeah, there's a blurry line there with the inner yeah. circle right now. Right. But at the same time, I'm liking this guy because I was entertained by that segment. So now it kind of counteracted all the ne the negativity he had me feel towards him, if that makes any sense. So, oh, definitely. so, so somebody came at me and said the other day, well, you're, you know, well, Steve Austin and Kurt Angle did this Jimmy crack corn and I don't care segment in Vince's office at one time. I said, yeah, but Austin was a butt kicker and a heel for how many years before he w went into like doing comedy stuff. Yeah. And MJF's very young, still in the business. Yeah. So I think they kind of, uh, hampered him a little bit with progressing as a heel mm -hmm. because of that but well you know time will tell we should see yeah i definitely i totally understand because me personally i'm a very storytelling person if you ever watch any of my matches it wasn't me doing flips and cool moves and stuff me being the heel i didn't think that was my place anyway not that i would do those in the first place but i love the storytelling aspect of it and i love like being able to get somebody emotionally invested into what was going on. Like I remember one time I worked a match at Shimmer and it was me versus uh, Thunder Kitty, which we we're both very old school fought mm -hmm. wrestlers. And they're like, we want the finish to be a sleeper hold. And we want to see if you guys can get that over. And we're like, all right, cool. So we did a sleeper hold. They did the whole one hand, you know, drop the hand three times. I lost, I went to sleep and they popped so loud in mm -hmm. shimmer because they're used to seeing like these big extravagant matches well maybe not like a totally crazy extravagant matches not wrestlemania but they're used to seeing like really cool moves and hard-hitting mm -hmm. matches and then you come out and you have us telling this story old school and i go to sleep to a sleeper hold and i remember mm -hmm. walking through the curtain and they're like i can't believe you just got that over <laughs> yeah, no it's a, you, you know it's it's because now it's unique now it's different yeah. But, you know, it wasn't like that was Piper's finishing move. Mm -hmm. Piper's finish was the sleeper hold. And, and I, see, people have this misconception. They say, what, you don't like cool moves? Yes, I do like yeah. the cool moves as long as they're done in context of the story of the match. Doing cool moves just to do cool moves. And then the lack of selling, for, for lack of a better term, afterwards. Yeah. Or not properly selling, you know, these big creative moves. To me, it hurts. Well, let's like, I mean, you, you say the sleeper was Roddy Piper's finish. You have, say, Jake the Snake who had the DDT. And now you see a DDT is just a move in a match. And people get up and turn into something else and something else and something else. And it's like, mm -hmm. but 
DDT. <laughs> Yeah, like and- it, you know, to me, it's still devastating. You're being dropped on your head. Like, but I yeah. mean, some people Preaching. can get it over. Some people still use it as a finisher, maybe a yeah. variation of it, but like, for example, the twist of fate, you know, it's still over. No, you're preaching to the choir. The Canadian destroyer has become a transition move. Oh, and that drives me nuts. Oh yeah. Don't get me started there. Either. <laughs> <laughs> well, a week ago, I, like I said, most of the time you and I agree on everything you say on the rough and rant. So I'm, I think I'm on the same page as far as that okay. goes. Now as a referee, mm-hmm. I, I don't know how you're going to quite take this, but this is my opinion. And actually Chris is cause we had this discussion upstairs earlier as the referee, you were there for 20 plus years at WWE Obviously, a lot of us, including me and my husband, believe that you are a referee that has become to the legendary status, in our opinion, and that we, we think that you should be inducted into the WWE Hall of Fame at some point in time. Who, if that day ever comes, would you like to induct you into the Wrestling Hall of Fame? Oh, my goodness. Uh, wow. That's a tough question. Thank you, first of all. That, 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 that is... Oh. That's really humbling to hear, um, and, and I appreciate it very much. My goodness, who would I? It, you know what? It would have to be either. It's almost like I feel like, I, again, two schools of thought here. Is it is it my mentor referee who was Dave Hebner at the beginning, mm-hmm. or Timmy White, somebody like that, or is it the guy who, who suggests, or is it Pat? Do you know what I mean? Because Pat was yeah. the one who suggested. It. Oh man, that's a tough one. Uh, you know what? It, it, to me, I, 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 if it's okay with you, I'm going to refrain from picking a person and just say that if that day were to ever come, it, it, it's okay. Whoever they, whoever's <laughs> chosen to induct, because that would be awesome. I think that's a fair answer because I mean, like you said, you've had this historic career there, being a part of so many iconic matches, TLC matches. WrestleMania matches, even matches you mentioned that weren't even on pay-per-views that you got to work with different stars. I mean, you have a whole list you could choose from and to put you on the spot like that, I guess it would be kind of hard to answer that question. No, it's it's, it's like I said, like, you know, I had like your, your longtime traveling partners, like, uh, for example, like a Tony Chimmel Mm -hmm. or, uh, or a Mike Chioda or somebody like that, or even, uh, even Larry Heck or somebody like that. You know what I mean? They're your traveling partners for so long. So, I don't know. It's, it, it is a hard one. Do, do you pick the guy who, who suggested you become a referee? Do you pick the guy who, Chief J. Strombo, who actually got you into the ring? Do you, you know what I mean? Definitely. Uh, Dave, Dave Hebner, who took you under his wing and kind of like mentored you, somebody like that. You know what I mean? Yeah. Well, so if there's anybody, because right now I've noticed there's an influx of new referees coming into the business nowadays. If somebody is looking out there to become a part of a, even an independent promotion or trying to work their way up to WWE, what would be your advice to an aspiring referee? Um, be a sponge and listen to everybody. And, and um, the, the hardest thing about being a referee, like I said before, is your job as a referee is to help the talent tell their story without being a distraction from the story they're trying to tell. You are invisible until you need to be seen if that Mm -hmm. makes any kind of sense. So um, watch some of the great, uh, see, I was a big fan of Tommy Young back in the old NWA days and WCW and stuff like that. And people look back and go, yeah, but Tommy was so visible. And I think that's what made him stand out at the time. But at the other, uh, watch guys like Timmy White, watch guys like David Hebner, watch guys like that, watch a Charles Robinson, guys who, you know, will do, uh, use subtle expressions in mm-hmm. the ring instead of overreacting to everything because i see there seems to be this thing uh, nowadays where the referees think they have to re- overreact to everything to get the moves over and they don't Definitely. as long as the talent is selling the moves properly the referee doesn't have to sell for them if that makes sense but if i have any advice watch the old guys watch the guys who used to do it the right way um you know hit me up i'll give you names to watch and <laughs> Well, that's what I love so much about you is you're so cordial. And like I said, we've met a handful of times, but like even on social media, like there's 
so many ways to contact you. And I know one of, um, one of my good friends, and I know you've mentored him a bit too, Jake Clemens, who just got signed to WWE as a, as a ref. He, oh, uh, Jake. Yeah, Jake. He's awesome. Yes. And, you know, I know he says a lot of great things about you being able to give him a lot of uh, advice over the years. Yeah. Now, Jake, Jake is a good guy. And, and, and that was the main thing, too, because uh, you don't want to try and judge people. But at the same time, you kind of get a feel for a person. And, and mm-hmm. I, felt, I felt his passion. Definitely. And felt, Me too. It, yeah. And, and, and I also felt that for him, it wasn't about him getting himself over. He just loved doing it and wanted to do it. You know what I mean? So yeah. So uh, yeah, I I wish him all the best. You know. Definitely. Well, I want to thank you so much for being on the show. Please tell everyone the social media accounts where they can reach you, so that they can ask you for advice, see Ref and Rant, they can see Ref to Chef, everything that you're doing on social media. <laughs> oh yeah, you, know, you can find me on Twitter at Jimmy Corderas, which should be easy enough to find, and I'm on I'm on Instagram as well at Real Jimmy Corderas because. Apparently there's an unreal one out there. Someone tried to, <laughs> to change it to real. Uh, Facebook, I'm, I, I have a um, former referee, Jimmy Corderas Facebook page as well. And you can find all my ref and rants on there. My ref to chefs will go up there. Uh, every once in a while, I'll post a comment. I try to, I, I'm, like I said, I'm trying not to be very negative nowadays, but at the same time, if I do have a critique, it's going to come out. So uh, you can hit me up there. And as long as people are, cordial and respectful, they're going to get the same back. Awesome. Again, I've had a stall for being on the show and I can't wait to have you on again because I know soon in the future, I'm just going to want to pick your brain about more refereeing. Oh, and as we say, parakalo, and uh, please say hello to Chris and, 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 uh, and the little guy. Of course, of course. Thank you so much, Jimmy. Until next time, this is Talking Sass. What a wonderful conversation that was with Jimmy. He's such a wealth of knowledge, and I'm so glad that he was able to come on my show. Make sure you go check out his book if you haven't read it already. Three Count, it's out. It's amazing. And he has so many stories that he shares with guys from that he's been on the road with. So you guys definitely, if you haven't read it already, will absolutely love it. And don't forget, while you're at it, go to my social media, at Sassy Steffi on Instagram and Twitter, because I need a name for Dan's segment. So make sure you go. And like I said, the winner is going to win a prize. All right. So guys, until next time, this has been Talking Sass. We'll see you next time.